Miss Moffat is a very unusual woman, Mrs. Watson. Terrible, strong-willed, of course. Terrible. She's whibbling me and that's the ear. I said, no, I said. Not for my past, I said. Your past? Before she took me up. But now that I'm going to court, she's called Blackie Bell. The court? The medicine like the religious court. Down into him in the street, I did. Clean and iron and collection, all grass. I've been a different woman ever since. Are you fine? Yes, I am. Well, now, I'm just in love, Mary. But, but, but what, what was your part? Last single. Mm-hmm. Everywhere I went. Terrible. All right, Mary. Now, get in here and hear the play of the fire. Oh, 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 Boys will do it to go to the pump and wash themselves. This is my home. It's not a coal mine. Oh, 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 oh. Did you understand what I said? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, 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 yes.
makes me feel that, that I want to know what is behind all of them books here. Can you come tomorrow, five o'clock? Oh, not a four seven, Miss. Uh, two smiles to walk. Seven, then. That will be all. Good night. Good night, Miss Crawford. Oh, are you the one I say? I, I am the one, Miss Crawford. What's wrong, Mr. Jones, come in here. Yes? Oh, I just got the fool. It doesn't matter about the bomb next door. Look out the school here. Here in this room. I'll be quiet. I'm going to get those boys out of that mine if I have to block my face and catch them up from the pit myself. Please, ring the bell, Mr. Jones. The bell is not a ring it. I want the try to hear it. Hear the trouble in And then I walk in the dark. I can touch with my hands where the corn is green. Here, and I'd like to do a flashy commercial on boarding. Music, please. Don't forget to fill out your federal postcard application correctly. Uh, out of the window, look. Uh, 
Mr. Oh, 
That's wrong. That man is so stupid, it puts on his head like a halo. What happened? What happened? In five minutes, I have given the squire the impression that he spent his whole time fostering genius and illiterate. I'm entering up to call him for a scholarship run. Oxford. Oh, 
enough to demand that, or enough for that dreadful thing with Miss Lawson. It was a run, Miss. Just a run. Oh, dear me. The squire has got to be here by now. So what's the squire coming for? Mm-hmm. Is it a good call? What was that? Thank you. The university appointed the squire and Miss Lawson to watch him so he cannot see what has happened. Oh, I almost forgot. For you, Miss Lawson, a card from Jesse. Oh, Erdogan. But you've been gone for weeks. You will not miss her, Mrs. Jesse? No. I don't like her, you know. Never have. But your own sister. I know, but I've just never been able to take to her. The very first time I saw her, I said, no. Well, it's not snowing, Ron. It should be more soon, Martha and the choir. Oh, Miss Moffat, would it not be splendid if he won? Two years isn't enough, Ron. Not even for him. He'll have strong candidates against him, boys from good schools. It all depends on how much the examiners will appreciate a highly original intelligence. But wouldn't it be exciting? It would be a wonderful thing for him. It would be a wonderful thing for rural education all over the country. And most of all, it would be a wonderful thing for you. You know, I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about Henry VIII. I have a feeling there may be a question about the old boy and the paper suit. I'd better cram one or two fat things in before he starts. He must have missed him. He must. Yes, Mr. Jones. He's come back, Miss Buffett. Yes, he's here. Aren't I there? But it cannot be you. Your mother just received a card. Well, Bessie, this is unexpected. Yes, yeah, your mother's in the kitchen. Who's there to see Mum? Then why are you here? Questions and answers, just like you, Ladan. You I've come to see. Perhaps you had better retire to the study, Miss Lumbery. Oh, oh yes, yes, of course. Very well, Bessie. I can give you exactly one minute of my time. Why? Morgan Evans is sitting for his Oxford examination this morning. Well, he needs it. He won't ever be going to Oxford. And why not? Because they're going to be a little stranger. I'm going to have a little stranger. You're lying. And if you don't believe it's Morgan Evans, you just ask him. Ask him about that time you locked me up. The night you had words with him. Oh. All women are doubted if he had no human feelings. You just ask him. I yeah. Oh, what can I see before? Does he know? I've come to tell him. And he'll have to marry me, of course, or I'll show him up. After all, the little stranger. Stop saying little stranger. If you're going to have a baby, then call it a baby. Have you told anybody? Mr. Jones is all. Why is coming up the road with Morgan? I'll wait for him here. You listen to me. For the next three hours, Morgan Evans is not going to be disturbed. You're not going to see him. You can't believe me the way I am. Hasn't sunk in yet, has it? I'm teaching you something, am I? You are going into the kitchen, Bessie, to see your mother. You will then go upstairs, and as soon as the examination is finished, we will talk it all over when we're a little more calm. You dear, I got to see it. You try to disobey. If you mention this to anybody before we've had that talk, even your mother. I shall strike you so hard that I shall probably sing. I mean every word of that. I don't mind. Three hours will go soon enough. Oh, oh, sir, oh, I'm so sorry. How kind of you. It's such a dreadful day. Not at all, Mrs. Pedagog. Anything for a laugh. Sit down, Morgan. The questions are in this envelope. Now, before I break the seal, I have a feeling they may bring up Henry VIII. I've written down a couple of dates. Here, memorize them. Yes, Miss Morgan. Glad it isn't me. Really quite stupid, you know. <laughs> now, Morgan, just don't get it too great. No. You're illegible. No. So aren't you going to wish my protege good fortune? Good luck. Thank you. Ready? Ready. This is your examination. Go to work. Miss Morgan. Yes? The very first question. In the age. <laughs> you know. We'll be hearing Act Three of the Coin is Green in a moment.
You know, I read a story some time ago that made me realize that there can be heroes of peace as well as heroes of war. It was about a husky MC in Tokyo name of Earl S. Whitney, Jr. He'd been supporting two war orphans, a Chinese and a Japanese, for three years on a private pay. He took little Fan Tung, age 13, under his wing first when the Chinese lad began hanging around the Tokyo base. Whitney rented a place for Fan Tung and took over the duties of a father. Then Hirayama Kyokichi, age 15, came along, and Whitney spread the other wing for him. For three years, he fed, educated, maintained, and clothed the pair. And then he took on a night job in a service club to earn some extra change. <laughs> he needed it. His army pay was $111.90 a month, and he spent about $100 a month on his two kids. He called the boys Mickey and Jimmy Whitney and hoped that someday they'd all wind up at his home back in Southern California. But in the meantime, even though he was only a private in the Army, he was a real hero to those two war orphans. And it all goes to prove that such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. It's midsummer now. Seven months since Morgan Evans took the examination for Oxford. Seven months since Bessie Watty suddenly returned and just as suddenly disappeared again without seeing Morgan. All week, Morgan's been far from the village, in Oxford, waiting word of his success or failure. How can you be so calm, Mr. Jones? Didn't you know the whole village is down at the railway to meet him? It's true. Oh, she hasn't wanted to break her heart. You would feel it so keen as all that? I used not to think so. But since his examination day, they have been so much better friends. It has been a pleasure just to hear them conversing. Any news, Mr. Jones? Uh, not yet, Miss Moffat. Where's the trial? To the railway, but with the rest of them. You do not appear nervous. Well, I'm past being nervous, Ron. If he has won, I shan't believe it, Lucky. And, and if he has lost? If he has lost? We must proceed if nothing has happened. Please, Mr. Jones, your report is on your desk. It's on very form two waiting for you. Yes, Mr. Morgan. I knew they'd be watching for me, so I, I got off at some office. What's that mean? I have no news, one way or another, except I'm no longer hopeful. Oh, why not? Well, they talk to me for hours. Oral examinations. They jump down hard on the New Testament, uh, as you said. This. You, you are very pale. Better than a raging fever. Go on. Well, uh, I spent ten minutes explaining why St. Paul sailed from a town 300 miles inland. Oh, dear. And the French? Not good. I said, not well, more to everything, but it did not fit every time. <laughs> Did the president send for you? He did. He asked if I had ever had strong drink, and I looked him straight in the eye and said, No. <laughs> I was terribly nervous. My collar flew open. He, he didn't seem impressed with me at all. And then as I was leaving, he appeared to be sorry for me in some way, and I, well, I received the impression that I failed. When shall we know? Today. Tomorrow, the next day, they'll send you the work. Failed. What? I cannot even talk about. But we must talk about it. You faced the idea of failure the day you left for Oxford. <laughs> but no, I've been to Oxford and come back. Come back from the world. Since the day, the day I was born, I've been a prisoner behind the stone wall. And now somebody has given me a leg up to have a look at the other side. They cannot drag me back again. They cannot. They must give me a point and send me over. I've never heard you talk so much since I've known you. Let's just think. I can talk now. The three days I've been there, I've been talking my head off. My second night there, I, I took a walk. There was a moon up. Not the same moon I've seen here. It's a different place altogether. All of a sudden, with one big rush against that moon, I saw this place again. You, that, were sitting here studying and all those books and everything I've ever learned from those books and from you was lighted up like, like a magic lantern, Rome, Greece, 
Shakespeare, Carlyle, Milton, everything. Everything had a meaning because I was in a new world. And so it, it came to me while you worked like a slave to make me ready for this color ship. I have finished. I didn't want you to stop. I have not been drinking, Miss Moffat. I know. I can talk to you too now. Yes, I'm glad. Finding this raising a definite strain, telling the lad they'll send the results through the post. Where is he? Still eating? And Miss Moffat says, please no questions till he's through. Well, whenever that will be, the young man will stop. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Just the fact that he had... Uh, uh, how'd you do? How are you, Squire? me. What, uh, what, what to do? Yes, <laughs> Just three days ago, yes, she sent money to you. Uh, did you not know receive the letter? Yes, I did. And all the others till I was sick of it. What is all this? I'm here to congratulate a certain young gent in case he's oh. won that scholarship. No, no, no. What has that got to do with you? You see, Miss Rogers, don't it's say. like Please, this. Don't say. Four weeks ago yesterday, I had a baby. You had a what? <laughs> Baby, seven pounds, nine ounces. Good heavens, how God, <laughs> But I've just come for the... Spencer here. Hello, Mum. My, you do look a golly mop. And where have you been all these months? And doing what, I'd like to know? Turning you into a granny. A granny? <laughs> well, thank you. Miss Moffat. So close the door, Morgan, and have a good sleep. Later we can... Hello, Miss Moffat. I've just been telling him you know what. Now I think it's time you told us who the fellow is. Proceedings, that's what I will take proceedings. That's my business. Who is it? Listen to me, Betty. I'll tell you anything. Anything. It's no good, Miss Moffat. It's Morgan Evans. Oh, I don't believe it. Oh, man. I've been dreading this for months. In a way, it's a relief. Well, there is he. I got a four-week old baby, and I haven't got a husband to keep him. Well, call him. There's no need to call him. I am willing to marry her, bestowing on the infant every advantage by bringing it up as a Baptist. You'd like that, Miss Moffat, wouldn't you? Oh, I'd like to oblige, really, but I couldn't. Besides, my friends would be furious. What friends? Mm -hmm. Ever such a nice gentleman, Mom, quite as well. I have never heard such a conversation outside a police car. <laughs> I suppose you wouldn't care to marry me. Good, good question. <laughs> Doesn't this friend of yours want to marry you? Don't talk of anything else. And he won't have the baby. So I've decided to give up my friend, Mary Morgan Evans. Unless Mr. Jones would consider the baby without me. Just think, you without you, your own child. What about your mother, love? I haven't got any, didn't you know? Oh, but the thing to say, I cannot remain here another minute. You want to make Morgan Evans marry you on the chance he will become fond enough of the child to ensure a future. Then your conscience will be clear, and later you can go off on your own. Mm, I shouldn't be surprised, sure. Meanwhile, it's worthwhile to ruin a boy on the threshold of... Oh, there must be a way out. There must be. And bless his mother, I got this. What? Why can't you adopt it? This is what it don't be with Would that be you, Betty? Would it? Yes. Yes, it would. But what would I do with a baby? I don't even know what they look like. Oh, they're lovely little things. Now it's all the right. No, stop it. It's what he sent her. Oh, do please. It put everything to right. He might grow up like his father, you know, and turn out quite nice. But it's mad. You're the grandmother, Walton, surely. Oh, I couldn't. Now, I don't bet it no ill will, but every penny I get goes to a court. You are the one, dear. Really, you are. Yes, you are, sir. You mean that if I do not adopt this child... I will have to tell Morgan Evans that he will ask to marry me. I swear that. And if I do, then I swear he'll never know a thing about it. Then I give in. Oh, that's lovely. My friend will be pleased. Well, I'll come along then and we'll arrange the tales later, shall we? 
I only did it to spite you, you know. Well, that's quick. For which we must be very truly thankful. For which... And Morgan? Has she gone? Why? Miss Quiet just told me. Oh, it's true. He thought I knew. Then he said it was for the best that I ought to be told. Oh, why? Why should this happen? There is no need for you to upset yourself. Miss Moffat is going to take care of me. What? I am going to adopt it. And what do you take me for? Then what would you like to do? What would I like to do? It's not a question of what I would like to do. It's what I'm going to do. I'm going to marry her and that's fine. I knew this would happen. Answer it, Walter. No. No, I'll go. It may be the squire and I don't want him here. Oh, thank you. It's a telegram. From Oxford. You have won the scholarship, Morgan. Come along with me, Mr. Jones, and I'll make you a lovely cup of tea. Oh, what's the use in women? Morgan. Now, look at him. If ever anybody has stood at the crossroads, you are now. It's no use, Miss Moffat. I'm going to marry her. I'm going to speak to you very simply, Morgan. I want you to change suddenly from a boy to a man. Now, I understand this is a great shock to you, but I want you to throw off this passionate obstinacy to do the right thing. Did you ever promise her marriage? No, no, no. Did you ever tell her that you loved her? No, no, but it makes no difference. There is a child living and breathing on this earth because of me, and I cannot turn from that part. But don't you know that she has her own plans and she doesn't want the child? If you marry her, you know what will happen, don't you? You will go back to the mine. In a year, she will have let you go. You will be drinking again, and this time you will not stop. That does not alter the fact that I have a duty to them both. Yes, you have a duty. But it's not to this... this loose little lady. You mean a duty to you? No. A year ago, I might have said a duty to me. But that night you showed your teeth, you gave me a lot to think about. You caught me unaware, and I gave you the worst possible answer back. I turned sorry for myself and taunted you with ingratitude. Yes, so I was a fool not to realize that a debt of gratitude is the most humiliating debt of all. That a little show of affection would have wiped it out. Morgan, I offer you that affection today. Why? Why are you saying this to me, no? Because as the moments are passing, and I am going to get my way, I know that I'm never going to see you again. Never again? But why? If you're not to marry her, it would be madness for you to come in contact with the child. So if I'm adopting the child, you can never come to see me. Common sense, Morgan. You've been given the push over the wall you asked for. But you, you will be staying here. Oh, can I never come back after everything you've done for me? Every morning when I take my walk up there where the valley suddenly drops here, you know the place? Yes. I have found myself thinking of you working for this scholarship and winning it. And I have experienced a feeling of, of complete happiness. I shall experience it again. You have no duty to me, Morgan. Your only duty is to the world. The world? Now that you're going, there's no harm in telling me something. I don't think you realize what your future can become if you give it a chance. You, you could become a great man of our country. If a light come into the mine, you said, remember? Yes. Make that light come into the mine and someday free these children. And Morgan, you could be more, much more. You could be a man for a future nation to be proud of. Perhaps I'm mad, I don't know. It's up to you. Uh I do not know what, what to say. I have been so much time in this room. The lessons are over, Morgan. Uh, I shall always remember. Well, I'm glad you think you will. Please, Miss Moffat. Yes, Edward? The band is out and Miss Morgan got to come to town hall. No, it's no joke. Oh, this man, please, never forget you. Goodbye, Morgan. I... I am so... I cannot talk.
Come to the show from servicemen bear postmarks from all over the world. And it's plain to see that they're having a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions among people of other lands. They're finding out, too, that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. For instance, in Saint-Comte in northern France, most of the men of the village are fishermen. Before venturing out to sea, they gather in the Notre Dame de Salute Church to make their devotions seeking divine guidance for a successful trip and safe return. Benediction services are held also in other parts of France, in England and Newfoundland, in Greece and Italy. They're of a religious nature, but uh, fishermen are pretty superstitious, too. Many of them will refuse to join a ship that doesn't have a mascot, and some refuse to sail on certain days or when the tide is running a certain way. I just don't think it'll be lucky for them. Well, all this might sound strange, but as our servicemen have observed, we have our own traditions about the sea. In some cases, these are religious, too, such as the services that are held in San Diego and Wilmington, California, at New Orleans and other fishing centers of Louisiana. We have other customs as far as luck is concerned. The crisping of a ship by breaking a bottle of wine or water over its bow. The carrying of a dog, cat, or other animal as a mascot. And the ritual still exists when crossing the equator of initiating the first climbers, introducing them to King Neptune, the royal chaplain, the surgeon, the barber, and the royal baby. It's an enduring custom that dates back into antiquity, when men in all seriousness paid homage to the sea gods. These things are part of our culture, and they have their equivalents among the customs and traditions of other people. A way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill between us and the people of other countries by observing these customs, by learning about them, and by honoring them. Now, here's Mr. Carrie Wilson with our star. And we welcome them back to the footlights, Claudette Colbert and Cameron Mitchell. <laughs> Claudette, I really am impressed. 24 appearances on the radio theater. Did you repeat some of your pictures several times? No. The only picture we ever repeated was Family Honeymoon. I did that twice. Well, I'm not only impressed, Terry, I'm completely discouraged. Imagine staring in all those pictures. <laughs> but your career is zooming ahead, Cam. Let me tell you about next week's play. It's the light-hearted, romantic adventure of a glamorous young model who finds her entire life rearranged by a chance encounter with a marriage broker. Yes, it's that hilarious hit from 20th Century Fox. The model and the marriage broker. 